Now this one today is possibly the nastiest, even bitchiest background going on to the recording of this LP that I've spoken about. The amount of uh, trouble, hatred I suppose you could call it, between the band members was uh, quite something. Um, at the time I didn't realise the depth of it, the severity of it, otherwise I may have been put off completely from even getting the record and missing out on a magical show when it came to Manchester. So what am I talking about? Well I'm talking about this. Pink Floyd, A Momentary Lapse of Reason from 1987. Out of programme as well, I don't often get programmes, but uh, I was very interested in the photography, gig photography, all that sort of stuff. So yeah, it made for a good programme, although looking back now the pictures are quite, uh, they're not particularly sharp compared to what you get nowadays, but hey-ho, it was 1987. So, I saw the band, obviously, 8th of the 8th, 88. I shall never forget it, not just because of the date, but because it was just great to see, if you can call it Pink Floyd, without Roger Waters, it was just great to see them. Um, there was a strange sort of low hum about 20 minutes before they came on stage. Don't know if that was part of the thing or not, but everybody was scratching their heads going, what's that noise? Um, when they came on, did Shine On You Crazy Diamond for about 12, 15 minutes. And then disappeared again. And Dave Gilmore just came up to the microphone and said, it's too bright. So we're going to disappear and come back a little later. And that was that. He, they were gone for half an hour. But he was right, it was too bright because it was August. It was a red hot, sunny day. And it was too it was too bright when they started, so he was right. But even when he came back, it was still too bright, and it was still too bright for another half an hour, really, before you could really see those lights, because obviously Pink Floyd in those days, or in any day, was hugely about the light show. So David Gilmore was correct to make that decision. Um, it was too bright, but anyway, they came back and they were great and everything. But I did feel. I did feel as though I was watching a Dave Gilmore solo gig. It just didn't feel like Pink Floyd, even though they played all the classics, obviously. It still just felt like a massive big vehicle for Dave Gilmore and friends, even though Nick Mason was there. You couldn't see him, but he was there. You couldn't see him from where I was. Um, I was on the pitch. Uh, not too far back, but still. Uh, you couldn't see, uh, you could kind of see Rick Wright, but there were so many people on stage, it just didn't feel like what I imagined a Pink Floyd gig to feel like, whatever that was. So it was kind of like watching a Dave Gilmore solo thing, but it was great, and it was great to hear the classics. And of course we had the flying pig going right over your head and uh, exploding. Brilliantly done, great theatrics, but that's what you expect, that's what you go for, isn't it? So, I'm glad I did go on, I'm glad I didn't have the in-depth knowledge of the bitterness between Waters and Gilmore because that kind of thing puts me off a little bit. I don't like fighting, I don't like infighting, but anyway, there you go, that's rock and roll for you. So the songs, what about this record then? The songs on the record itself, I mean, they're good, people say, is it a Pink Floyd album? In places it is, in places it isn't. In places it's a bit boring, to be honest with you. Uh, Roger Waters absolutely slammed it, but I suppose he would, wouldn't it? Because he was so bitter. It wasn't as bad as he said. Um, even though it really is just about David Gilmore on this, because the other two really aren't on it. They're just not on it. it uh, the drums are a lot of them electronic and recorded by other people. Um, Nick Mason felt a lack of confidence 
which he went on to regret apparently. Richard Wright's keyboard bits were already recorded before he was introduced back into the band. So they're not on it, this is really just about Dave Gilmore. Uh, the songs starts with Signs of Life, Learning to Fly, The Dogs of War, One Slip, On the Turning Away, that's all side one. It's really, really good. It is really good. Um, Dogs of War is fantastic. Enjoy, I enjoy learning to fly. I don't really like the electronic drum sound, but um, One Slip's cool. And On the Turning Away is the masterpiece on the record, as far as I'm concerned. That's when they really, really, really start to sound like Pink Floyd. Side two, <sighs> side two in many ways is quite forgettable in many ways. Uh, some nice keyboard bits, but they weren't by Rick Wright. But it does finish with Sorrow, which is another Pink Floyd classic, and that does sound like Pink Floyd. So it's a mixed record. It's a mixed record. Um, but it is still, to me, a Pink Floyd record. Once you get past this and go into uh, Division Bell, which I didn't like at all, and stuff after that, there wasn't much after that, but... So to me, this is the end of Pink Floyd. To my mind, this is where Pink Floyd stopped. I was not interested in Division Bell, not at all. Um, I've seen a video of this tour. The tour was massive, and very successful, and I'm glad it was as well, because it was great to see it. Um, I've seen the video and that, it's okay, but it doesn't compare to that day I spent at Main Road in Manchester watching Pink Floyd. It doesn't compare to it at all. So what did the critics think of this? Well, it was mixed. A lot of people asked the question, is it really a Pink Floyd album or is it a Dave Gilmore solo album? And of course, they were right to question that. Um, obviously Roger Waters panned it, he said it was dreadful, um, almost childlike in some places, I think he said. It wasn't that bad, it's not that bad. If you've heard it, then I think you'll agree it's not as bad as they're saying it is, it really isn't. Most of it was actually recorded on David Gilmore's boat, which is huge. I was used, I don't know if he still uses it or not, but massive big thing called Astoria, and that was moored on the Thames. So he had a big floating studio in there, obviously. Um, well, the whole thing was a floating studio in some respects. And a lot of it was recorded there, but it was recorded in many different places. As far as the charts go, well, my favourite uh, my favorite country, the Finns, I didn't think that much of it. Only got it to number 48. There were a couple of countries that did well, apart from us in the States. Australia really liked it, number two. Austria really liked it, number three. Holland, number two. Germany, number two. New Zealand, number one. Well, well, well. I'd never thought of that. Norway, number two. So it did well all over Europe. Switzerland, number two. Here, number three. Good old UK. And the United States, number three. So it did quite well. It did do quite well, considering the amount of um, controversy and uh, everything that went on. I mean, you, you guys, you really need to read what went on if you, if you don't already know. It's, it's just madness, absolute madness. Lawsuits here, lawsuits there. Crazy, crazy times. But I'm glad I didn't know about all that because I would have missed a great gig and not a bad record. It's not bad. It's okay. So that's Pink Floyd. A momentary lapse of reason from 1987.